Hello, and welcome to another episode of It's Okay Till It's Not, season two. And as Jamie and I promised, we're diving in a little bit deeper. If you've been listening to our podcast, we've been talking a bit in snippets here and there about our shadow side, the demons within, and releasing them. And we have a profound story to share with you today. Um, This is Jamie's story about what she's released, how she's still in the middle of it, and how sharing is so healing. So Jamie's going to kind of jump in and talk about where she's at now and how she got to this place. Yeah, thank you. Um, I feel like it's just, it's just time, right? Like for people who do know me and have listened to the podcast and or been in front of me while I teach in person, like little snippets of my story, um, come out a lot and it always is in context to whatever it's pertaining to but I feel like um, over the last few podcasts that we've done and if it's an Instagram post or something that I've made that it seems like people want a little the whole bit more. story yeah the whole story I think and so where we're at right now or for where I'm at right now is I'm able to give you hindsight and for hindsight is very linear but the whole healing process is not like it's I don't want people to hear this and think that I took one foot and put it in front of the other. And then that's how I got to where I am because there's a big, lots of curves and messes along the way. And so Jamie, just tell us what it is that you're healing from and give us a little bit of a framework of what it is. Cause we all have our own trauma that we've healed from, but what's your specific trauma? Uh, mine shows up as body image issues, d- body dysmorphia, eating disorder is probably the root Um, of those. I haven't been clinically diagnosed. I do have a therapist, but I haven't been clinically diagnosed as uh, body dysmorphic or having an eating eating disorder, but I'm clear that those two are very much the root of my um, experience in this, in this life and in this body. Mm -hmm. Um, So I can tell you that um, my growing up years were pretty normal. Like, I feel like I don't remember, like, if this didn't happen as I was a child, I was an athlete, I was um, smart, I, not that any of that has to do with So you don't remember any, um, any type of eating disorder when you were really young? No. Overthinking what you were eating or maybe mm -hmm. even overeating or nothing around that? No, there wasn't a whole lot of attention and that was based on our foods. Um, mm-hmm. My parents separated into divorce when I was pretty young. They both independently ate um, pretty, I don't know, I- I'm going to use the word healthy in air quotes right now because uh, there just wasn't, I'm just going to say there wasn't relatively a healthy. healthy. Right. I mean, it just wasn't like they didn't say you're eating healthy. They just didn't have like sugar or I didn't have a, I'm still to this day, uh, um, I'm old enough to tell you that this is going to be awe striking for lots of people. I've never had a dark soda in my life. And so, um, we just didn't have them around. Wow. (laughs) Yes. And my grandma, well, I was just saying my grandma was a diet Dr. Pepper drinker, but you dare not touch them. They're hers. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, so I grew up totally different. We didn't talk about food at all. It wasn't like a big thing, but now looking back in retrospect with some education on food, I mean, I had root beers, root beer, by the way, with a frozen snicker bars, fabulous combination. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, we'll get to this eventually, but like, you know, there just wasn't any, like you're eating too much, you're eating too little. I mean, I came from a, a Jewish family and you know, they're, they're really, they really love feeding you and our food is the love language but they never said well uh, then this happened there was a point in my life where I I can now look back and hear a lot of the conversation was uh from my dad from my some people are pretty close around me that would say oh it's good to see you you look great oh have you lost weight have you, oh, you've put on a few pounds. Um, I've, I heard that. I mean, I hear that now, but I don't know that it affected me that. I don't know that it shaped anything that I did then or I was overly concerned then. I'm sure it planted some seeds based on mm-hmm. where I am today, but it's only in hindsight that I could actually look back and say that I heard those things ever. 
Um, I do remember at one point my dad telling me that he only married my mom because she was beautiful. I remember one time um, my dad wanted to put me in pageants and my mom said something like, when she loses, it's going to break her heart. Um, but I remember hearing them. I just don't, I'm not going to put a lot of weight into saying that's exactly what shaped my eating disorder and my body image issues. But um, when I was graduating uh, high school, uh, I was an athlete. I went into college as an athlete. I um, was in college and I started to decide what it is that I wanted to do with what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I decided that I would go into personal training. And the reason why it wasn't anything to do with my appearance or anybody else's appearance, but it was because um, I saw it as a way to be healthy. I used to work as a physical therapy assistant and I would see um, people going there because they had to. And I wanted to be a want and not a need because when people make decisions from want or choice or desire, instead of my doctor told me I have to be here, it's yeah. two different types of personalities, right? So that was my root. That was my intent. But the pinnacle of what personal training looks like is bodybuilding. It's a bodybuilding show. Like if you mm -hmm. personal train for aesthetic reasons, um, it's the pinnacle of it is to get on stage 90% naked and show yourself off in this way. Um, Which you did do, is that right? Five times in once every year for five years from 99 until 2005. And um, the moment that changed my life. So the, the moment was, I, I just wrote about this for those of you who are listening and read my Instagram and stuff, but um, I competed <laughs> the first time and nobody prepares you for the post com competition, anything. They don't tell you what's gonna happen the day, the five minutes after you get off stage and you actually eat like a normal person. And by normal person, it's not weighing out your food. Food has actual taste to it, etc. cetera. Um, but about a week after I got off stage and I was over at uh, my boyfriend's house at the time and we were going out and I had these banging, <laughs> pair of white linen pants guess they were like this was in the 90s y'all um <laughs> <laughs> and they were a size like zero or three and I had no business I'm five nine I've right. been curvy my and athletic my whole life I had no business being in a size zero or size three and you're at least I would say you're probably medium boned too depends on where you take the measurements my yeah. wrists are very small <laughs> that's true <laughs> <laughs> Being your yeah, bracelet I mean, maker, I will vouch for that. <laughs> right, right. So I, um, I, uh, had, they fit me fine like a week prior. And by fine is that I rocked them. And then I went to put them on for this date just a week later. And um, I couldn't get them up past my middle thigh. And I dropped to the floor. I took fetal position. I cried like a baby for, mm. I don't know, it seemed like an eternity. And my, the light switch went off, the, my mind flipped. And I went from mm -hmm. that moment from doing it as a way to mark something as a, as a, as a pinnacle to what I'm able to achieve in my career. Like, like if I can teach, if I can be taught to do what I could teach somebody to do, it was my plan. Mm -hmm. It turned it into an immediate addiction. And can I interject that every yeah. time there's a trauma, everybody measures a trauma from before this day to after that day. And yeah. for you, whenever we have talked and Jamie has shared about her journey through healing and body dysmorphia, it always comes down to that day. Yep. And so that day was the, the day of the, the trauma came to your awareness, I think. It did. And for it sure. ran my life. So mm -hmm. when I was training for that show, I can hear clear as day, the people around me, like I would show up, my family would have dinners every Sunday. If it wasn't every Sunday, it was certainly one Sunday a month. And we would go over there and I would bring my already pre-measured tasteless food because mm -hmm. I had a competition to endure uh, soon enough. And, you know, I, I wanted to be, I was picking myself apart, body part by body part. Uh, which isn't very healthy. No, um, you just or don't very see yourself fun as a whole. at all. Or it was, yeah. it was such a thrill to hear people say, can't you just eat this one piece of pizza or one piece of whatever? Mm -hmm. And I'd say, 
I hope my competition thinks that because I was going to win. I was competitive as shit. Um, this time, I didn't realize it was against myself. I was looking at beating these people who were on stage working equally as hard and I was out to get them. The problem with it, I mean, if you take a step back, you see that it's completely like subjective. Yes, but when you <laughs> say competitive against yourself, um, I, I feel like it's important for our viewers, listeners to know that control, right? Absolutely. So when you're competitive against yourself, it's to prove I can do this. I can control this. I'm in control. Mm -hmm. Right. To the core. This was right. Because that, that seems to be an underlying theme with um, eating disorders is yeah. control. Yes. And it manifests in the body because something that you can see, it's a tangible gauge, mm -hmm. right? Like if I do an hour of cardio and lift weights and eat like this, I can visibly see the change in my body. It's absolutely a hundred percent way to control um, something. And unfortunately it was my body that mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, the thought process. Why would I even, right. <laughs> why would I even care about what I was thinking? Because what I was thinking was turning me into a, and I wasn't <sighs> happy then. I right. Was miserable. I got divorced during that time. I, um, had my bones. I hurt like hell. Everything hurt on me. I, I it, it was just miserable. I was miserable. Didn't yeah. care. There was a mean, I would imagine you wouldn't have a lot of lubrication in your body. None. So would I'm just curious, but would you go as far as saying that it, it was even an addiction? 100%. Yeah. And the problem with it being an addiction, it, I mean, being this addiction is that it's socially acceptable. It's actually socially promoted, yes. right? Like yes, when, promoted was, even. That's the key. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people can, I, I will not even judge any addictions because they all result from the same root, in my opinion, whether it's lack of self-worth or lack of, mm -hmm. you know, any of sure void filling at its finest but because this one is promoted by you it's so good to hear oh my god how do you do this nobody there's a very small percentage of people who will actually put themselves through what i did the many times that i did some people right. make a career out of it but you know i commend you when you don't so after i got done with the shows i absolutely refused to train anybody for that day. Uh, let me tell you real fast where training got me. Um, the fifth year I had hired another trainer. I, I went through, I had one for the first, the same one for the first two. And then I think I tried the third show on my own, but by the show I wanted a perfect, like a um, MPC, like professional person who had done this their entire life. And it was a woman. Most of my trainers before had been men. Um, and so I was like, I'm going for the best of the best. This woman had me measure my pee, however much I peed was only the amount of water I could drink. And I was only oh. allowed to eat baby food. It's disgusting. Whoa. And so it's a complete- That's so unhealthy. It's very unhealthy. So when you look at people on stage, they're like borderline death. The process of being judged on stage is quarter turns, stand forward. I, I did bodybuilding, natural bodybuilding for the first two shows because there wasn't anything else that I would fit in. I've always had large breasts and uh, a big butt. And because of that, like I didn't really fit in the bodybuilding circuit. I never could get lean enough um, or, or muscular enough because I wouldn't take drugs uh, to get there. I took everything over the counter that was available to me. So I'm not saying that I'm beyond any of it. I just wouldn't do anything illegal. Mm -hmm. sold not saying that the stuff that's being sold is great but they at least have it monitored to some degree and so um i uh, they finally uh came up with a category that was basically just a tits and ass show and it was um figure and so i moved from bodybuilding natural bodybuilding into figure because i felt that it was actually something that i could win i just hadn't been able to win bodybuilding whatever mm -hmm. that means <laughs> god help me I, i'm so glad i didn't because i'd probably still be in it but um, yeah, so I took all of these rules that you turn to the right, you turn to the right again. And when, by the time you get on stage, like people don't know they're right from left. You're so carb depleted. You have yeah. zero water in your body. You haven't eaten anything worth talking about in at least three months. Like it's treacherous. It's treacherous. Uh, I can't imagine. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm standing up there in less than strings, basically in high heels that you have 
uh, here's a funny little story that just for a side note is that I was in my first might have been first or second show and we all get gather in the same they called the pump up room in the same room before we're called on stage by our groups and um you're painted the night before with this crazy paint it's not um it's not tanner it's actual paint mm. because the lighting on stage will drown you out and you want to see the def the definitive That's differences a... between your muscles and skin it's a complete optical illusion anyway so they paint you and then they spray you down with usually pam cooking spray and then you stick um like vaseline in your cracks of like your elbows and your knees so the paint doesn't like get super dark when your knees uh when you extend your legs etc well somebody in the pump up room accidentally bought the garlic scented or flavored spray of pam <laughs> and all of us were like drooling on one hand and so pissed on the other hand because none of us had eaten in like i don't know months and, uh, eat each other <laughs> right we were so mad at this guy we're like really garlic bam we all have to go on stage soon it was pretty funny i mean the silliest thing but... so were you only eating baby food right and only Alasha, as much yeah. water as you urinated were you constantly feeling hungry or did you get used to that i've heard the reason i'm asking is i've heard that when you get to a certain point of starvation when you're starving yourself that you it releases a lot of endorphins and it's almost like a high i don't remember the way that i actually felt i had just been mm -hmm. such a professional i mean prior to eating baby food which in some way had more flavor than the boiled chicken i was eating beforehand i mean and here's a perspective for you the last not the baby food show but the show prior to that my i remember one of my it's not a cheat meal but one of the meals i actually enjoyed eating um was a t canned tuna with nothing in it except either i think it was salsa or mustard and then a rice cake a, fla a flavorless rice cake and i remember thinking that that was some sort of delicacy <laughs> some sort of like gift i was giving myself was this canned tuna um usually mustard and a rice cake and then after the show so like after the show, you always have, I still remember what they are to the stated five shows. I remember exactly what all five of the meals I wanted after the show to treat myself with of normal food. Mm -hmm. And after the show, I decided that I was hungry in between like my clients or something. So I reached for the same thing that I thought was a treat back then as a treat or at least, a, you know, intermittent meal uh, while I was working and I about threw up. It was so disgusting. Like, don't do it. Don't eat it. It's awful. And um, I was like, how did I think this was even good? Like, so I can't tell you that any of my cognitive decisions were valuable during this time of depletion. You just don't know, like your reality is completely askew of what food is. And because on the, on the underside of all of this, picking your body apart, I mean, it's self-loathing. So I was virtually hating myself through food. And because of that like I would only go out to eat for it to be a way of loving myself as I let other people cook for me virtually hating yourself through the control of food through the control of food sure yeah and it's so interesting how full circle you've come to now you make the most delicious yeah. mouth-watering <laughs> thank you <laughs> desserts ever yes so the time that I started to look well something happened in 2000 and I don't know. My last show was in 05. By 07 or 08, I was looking for something. I remember my business partner at the time telling me that I was a victim in one way or another. That's a different podcast. But I remember hearing that and taking it very personally and, and just adamantly not believing that I was a victim. So I ended up moving. I went to Phoenix. I worked for a company when I got there. It was a, it was a restaurant which had been in my, you know, I'd worked at restaurants before. But this one treated food differently. It was very much about health and health in a in an anti-inflammatory way. It wasn't about mm -hmm. like counting your calories. It was just eating for a place for the for the body to feel better. So being in that culture very much um, supported me in this moving out of this mindset. But about 2000 and I don't even know what year it was. I met my Ayurvedic uh, practitioner at the time, and he asked me this. <laughs> 
one question like, do you cook? And before he could finish the sentence, I said, I'm not even kidding. The kitchen is just the room that I go between from the living room to the garage. <laughs> I had zero intention on ever spending time in the kitchen. And then right. by the end of my consultation with him, he said, make cooking a meditation. Mm. And then I started to ball like a baby, similar to when I, <laughs> my pants was on the floor. Yeah, yeah. It was like, you are so right. Like I need to do this for mm -hmm. myself. So I realized that there was some, you know, I had started to grow in self-love and self-worth is because this rang true to me. And that's the day that my journey changed back. Like I was heading in a different direction. Right. So it started with self-loathing to yeah. the point, you know, it, you couldn't even get your pants on to then turning it into rather than using food as control, but using it and giving it intention and love. Yeah. When I finished bodybuilding in 05, by 07, I went from being a meatitarian where I ate a gram and a, to a gram and a half per pound of body weight of meat protein amongst all of the supplements that I would have to take to supplement the nutrients I wasn't getting from the actual food I was eating, strangely enough, to a vegetarian at first. And I realized that the most of my consumption was going to be carbohydrates because I, and there's always a natural source of protein, but it wasn't as significant. It wasn't going to be a gram to a gram and a half. I mean, just for perspective, I think I weighed 145 pounds. So that was going to be 145 grams of protein, which mm, roughly is about six to seven chicken breasts a day. I mean, right. If you don't know what face Laura just made, because <laughs> you're <laughs> listening to this, it was that's horror. That's too much. Yeah. Right. That's just, whoa, right. too so, much. So too much. And it tasted like shit. I used to tell people oh. that I, you know, if there's any meat that I miss, I've been, I'm, I moved towards vegan. I'm vegan ish now, but, um, I've said that even if I went back to eating meat, I would never eat chicken again. I know so much chicken. I could, no, I better. can imagine like, <laughs> that explains that weird box sound that you make once in a while when we're talking. Yeah. I just brushed my feathers off the other day. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was crazy. So I thought w with the way that this diet controlled me it was once I start eating more carbohydrates I'm obviously going to get gain weight get fat um whatever like I had all the stories because it wasn't in the frame of understanding of nutrition as I had before so anybody listening right now I have to say this who was under my guise then I apologize from the deepest place of my heart because I this is what I also used to teach to people and at the time it was my truth and it is no longer my truth, yeah. uh, which I still work on daily, what is actual truth or not for me, but that way of um, pounding that type of nutrition down people's throats, I'm deeply sorry. And uh, I pray that you have found some sort of light since then, <laughs> as have I. So where would you say you are right now on the journey? Yeah. Um, so all of this is still a part of me. I okay. deal with um, the stories I tell myself constantly. And sometimes they take me down. But what I also understand, so I'm gonna, uh, the easiest way to put this is just in a in story form, is I walked out of the shower one day, obviously naked because I was just doing the shower, I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror and the thought that I heard I heard my, me tell myself, you disgust me into the mirror, the person in the mirror, which was still me. <laughs> um, and I went, huh, I don't talk to myself that way. Like it was this like weird, huh, I don't, I just don't talk to myself that way. What is this thought? So after it didn't happen right away, but the, the summary of what had happened is right now I'm having thoughts. I don't know what they are. I, I don't hear them. I have a pretty vacant mind, typically. So I don't know what, if people are listening, what kind of thoughts that they hear. If they hear, sometimes they see them in pictures, sometimes they see them in colors, but I don't hear my thoughts. This thought I heard, which made me realize that it is no longer part of the trajectory of thoughts that I have that are my truth. So um, for instance, I walk right foot, left foot when I go from here to the bathroom, but I don't think about it. It's just part of what works for me right and so this thought used to work for me and because it no longer works for me it is outside my thoughts that i'm having currently so i heard and that's why it was so 
bold prominent. and yes. right. So I have a choice when I hear that thought. And I feel like this is what happens for lots of people who fall on and off the wagon of their addictions is I see this as the thought that says I either can surrender to that thought or I can see it as an old thought because I'm not the thought, I'm the thinker, right? I can see it as a thought that's not part of my belief system anymore. Mm -hmm. And then give it its attention. That's nice. Thanks for showing up and telling me that this is once the person I used to be. It's hard to know that I used to hate myself so much. It's, it's awful. But I also used to fill my life with people who supported that thought. So every boyfriend I ever had, every person that I was around for this period of time, also, I must have disgusted them or they met me in the thoughts that I disgusted myself at because it kept me in this place where I never heard that thought because I kept working out to hate myself or eating to hate myself and when they were reinforcing it correct they were just keeping me in that same journey so yeah because I choose a life now that's different I don't talk to myself that way the people I surround myself love me regardless of what I think or what I look like, I guess that, that thought, that thought became so loud that I heard it like pay attention to me. I I feel like that's literally what it was doing was screaming Mm -hmm. for attention. And so I have to remember that I can, I can make the choice. If I wanted to go run to the gym in that moment, because I disgusted myself and do the same thing I used to do, then that's just like somebody who is in a different addiction, either choosing to have a glass of wine because that thought was louder than what they were willing to do otherwise with. Right. In that no moment. Harm. Correct. Right. No harm, no in that foul. Moment. Right. So um, the second thing I recognized in this trajectory is that I am now no longer attacking myself when I have thoughts, these thoughts, I'm attacking the thought. So instead of hearing the thought and then either trying to change my food or my behavior, because I'm not the bad one. The thought is the bad one if we have to label it. And so I go, wow, I wonder why I had this thought today. Or wow, I wonder why this one screams so loudly. Like now I'm trying to define, depict, you know. And it could even just be some residual. And I love how you brought up how we aren't our thoughts. There's always collective thoughts running through as well. So I like that you're able to separate though and realize that the thought is just the thought. It doesn't mean that's still where you're at and it doesn't send you back down that rabbit hole. And it has. I mean, I, I, there's days that I've spent in bed in fetal position, just wrestling with thoughts. Like mm. I go, I'm not doing this today thoughts. And the thoughts are like, oh yes, you are. <laughs> and we lay in bed and we fight, but I don't act. What I give myself the most amount of credit for is I just don't act on them. I don't do anything detrimental because I'm healing. Right. Mm-hmm. So if I full circle this back to, um, I'm certain my body is different. It should be. I'm also different than when I was six. And for people who are 40 something years old, also understand that they shouldn't have the body of a six year old. They shouldn't have the body of my 21 year old self because, because it just you're is, not. Right? Yeah. Right. Cause I'm not. And, um, so I just lost my train of thought. Anyway, just like, um, it's okay until it's not right. The whole point of this, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the um, whole point of it. So I'm sure that I have, I just am also understanding that there are far more interesting things about me than my appearance and than the size I, of your thigh. Correct. Yeah. Both yes. of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I used to say this all the time. So like prior to my, the day that I, leaned into the addiction um is i used to say it's okay my whatever my body was it's okay i could lose it in a fire i used to always try and just cultivate being a better person and showing up in this world in a better way emotionally but somebody said to me well the first thing they see is your body or the first thing they see is you physically i wouldn't say my body because my personality i don't know it might precede me i feel like people who are in a really bad mood their mood shows up first in the room rather Mm -hmm. than their body and there's people who are gorgeous quote unquote you know your type and have the best bodies who are assholes Mm -hmm. and so therefore they're just not attractive so I take um pride in saying that I do think that my who I am as a person precedes me as who I am physically and I'm your energy yeah the energy that comes off around you I think for everybody you know, and I don't know how I'm described for the people who want to just like me because I have said body. That's nice. But 
it's not, it's not who I, who I am. I used to have a girlfriend that would uh, run next to me on the treadmill. And she says, Jamie, they're only looking at you because you have big tits. And I was like, well, I might have big tits, but if I'm a complete asshole, they're not going to stick around for long. So it might be what draws you in, but whether it's, you know, a, a personal relationship or friendship, like, or business right. relationship, it's just, I, I pray that with all of this, um, it's what, not what's going to keep them around. And I think that's an interesting point though, that you just brought up because you used to have boyfriends and said friends, family members that fed your story. And now you're around people that don't feed that story anymore. And I would imagine that that's because your energy has shifted and that is a tangible piece of the healing part. Yeah. You Thank know, you. like part of the addiction was the tangible piece where you, oh, I can see, I can see this difference. But this is also very tangible too. When you look outside of the world that you've created around you is represent to, rep, represents a very different Jamie than the world beforehand. Yes. It was superficial. It was mm -hmm. um, insignificant of sorts. Uh, and so when I got jarred by my business partner, I recognized that because of the superficiality and the insignificance, I was also becoming a victim to things. And when he pointed it out and I was willing to hear it, when those two worlds collide was the trajectory of my life changing to where it is now. Um, I, I understand that I used to try and make that if this weight gain, if I have, I don't, I don't even know. I know my clothes fit differently, but if this is, um, healthy. And so I, the things that we deem healthy are so interesting because if you can look at somebody and see that they're lean, uh, zero body fat, we'll just talk women for right now. Cause men have a different, um, way of carrying fat than women do, but women need it, especially for their periods, etc. But like, if you can deem somebody healthy by the way that they look like, God help us. Uh, it's not the case. Like even by the metrics that some doctors, and I don't discount doctors. I just feel like if they tell you that your BMI is something, which is about a 50 year old past tense science, it doesn't, it's not useful or your body fat. Um, it's just crazy to me that you're, you're judged by these markers and they don't mean, because uh, they don't mean a lot. They mean something, but they're not the only thing to, to mm -hmm. judge yourself your health by, because like I said, when I was doing the best and, and looking the best and I was, I was hurt. My joints hurt. Right. My heart hurt. I had terrible friendships. Right. I had and that sounds like our biggest marker is, is how we feel. Yes. Right. Like how, how our body feels. Yes. I mean, I could tell you full circle the amount of times I used to tell people that I was a personal trainer and people would say, you know, like, what do you eat? And I would tell them this crazy curated diet for the way that I looked. And there was like, they were like, well, my grandma smoked 12 packs a day, ate all the meat and chicken in the world that was fried up in bacon grease. And she lived to be 108. And I thought it's probably true that she lived to be 108 under all of those circumstances because she was happy. <laughs> it's because yeah. she surrounded herself with her family. She lived on a farm. It's probably and you know, she didn't have a negative idea about the food. So one correct. thing I've noticed is that with the education has come in so many judgments then, whether we're doing it outwardly yes. or internally, but then we judge it and then we get scared of it yeah. rather than, you know, you know what I mean? It, it reminds me of a con, uh, podcast that Jamie and I did beforehand that you might want to check out, but it's like through the lens that you look through. And as your lens, as you started to see food differently, as you started to relate to food differently, yeah. your whole lens shifted. And yeah. now again, she makes the most <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I love f food and I are, I, you need it. It is fuel. Mm -hmm. You do need it to live, but you can also um, enjoy great conversation with food. You can, um, it, it's community building. Like I think it's yeah. one of my favorite things about food is that it's not only life sustaining as far as what you're putting internally in your body, but it's life sustaining because it brings you closer to people. What date or pre outing do you not meet 
with your friends and for food. We have the food. best dinners. Yeah, we have the best dinners over food. And when the whole pandemic started, that was one of the things that is the thing that I miss the very most was sitting with some of my dearest friends and, and enjoying food together, breaking bread together. Yes. And there is, there's always the unhealthy side to that is the people who use food to punish and use food to that's the unhealthy side is that when you start labeling food, uh, here's a story. Cause I know everybody sees, <laughs> well, here's a story. So I make this breakfast and it's typically mixed berries, oats, a little bit of like maple syrup, a little bit of vegan butter, try some pecans and I bake it. Okay. That's breakfast and I enjoy it and it's delicious for what I called air quotes dessert one night, I made a berry, call it a cobbler. I don't know. Same exact ingredients. It was berries. It was pecans. It was oats. It was a little bit vegan butter. It was some maple syrup, but it was made in a different platform, container. Right? <laughs> yes. And because I called it dessert the next morning, I went to pick it up to warm it up, to eat it for breakfast. The thought came to me, uh. this is dessert. Why are you eating dessert for breakfast? And I was like, it's so sick. Like I had a full on knockdown drag out ball with my <laughs> thought in the middle of the kitchen saying it's quite literally the exact same contents of what I had for breakfast. I don't know the day or week before, but because I called it dessert, I was, <laughs> I was going toe to toe with the Mike Tyson of thoughts. Like, are you right. kidding me? Right but now? that, I mean, seriously, that just shows how important, like the way we label things are, the way we look at things, the yeah. lens, stop and question that. I mean, I really encourage you to say like what you did with yourself, like go toe to toe with yourself, go toe to toe with the different labels and the way you're viewing things. It might cause you to have a big shift and yeah, like I it did read, Jamie. I read something today, which was obviously great timing for what we were, uh, Video recording for but it said like this diet culture and how many diets are there right like so many I, and, and they're supposedly for all the types of people but they're just all the ways to control people to get them to something that they're they're not and that's exactly what the quote said if diet culture was supposed to be like real and normal and healthy it wouldn't be a diet like it wouldn't be a diet I mean obviously right. this isn't verbatim but like they wouldn't be telling you to do something different if it was normal or natural or necessary you know what I mean like why are you what are you running from like what's the I don't know if I'm fat folk. I don't know how I feel about the word fat in itself because it's the one thing I can tell you that other than probably um, some like even racial slurs that I would couple together. Like to me, the word fat, if you describe somebody that way, it really feels harmful to me. And it's mm -hmm. not because I don't know that I want to be that or I am that or whatever, but like, it's the one word where I feel like everybody with very few exception, because tides are definitely turning, that the word fat is potentially riddled with the most amount of shame because if you call somebody sure blue, or if you call somebody of you course know, whatever the, yeah. the guy in the red shirt the guy with the I don't know right it has a lot of negative connotation there's a lot of energy throughout the years because when people use the word they don't use the word as a compliment correct so it has gotten a very negative energy around it if somebody yes. were to say that to me Katie actually my daughter the other day said you're like one of those cute chunky moms and I was like, chunky, hmm, chunky, you know, and it has the same connotation as, um, as fat. And then she kind of backpedaled from it a little bit, but it didn't feel like something I wanted to hear. Yeah. So here's the, I wonder, so here's how this plays perfectly into the situation of my understanding. My dad and I were talking and I understand that he is uh, the source of my I'm going to use this real loosely, the source of my pain. And I only mean that is because I chose bodybuilding because I knew that at the root of bodybuilding, I was going to be able to talk to my dad. We were estranged for a while. We have since mended. I love my dad to death. This isn't 
dad shaming. This is just saying I understand where this started from. So my dad was absent and I knew that if I picked a profession that was in alignment with him, there would be something that we could talk about and have a bond with that was very subconscious. Very and unconscious. you used to hear from them when you were younger, oh, you're skinny or oh, you lost weight. So there was also... Right. And he was, he, sh he showed up to my shows. He did support me. So it was like the first time that I could do something that in turn brought him into, into your world. world. So mm -hmm. I knew that what his words had... They, they they held very heavy in my formative understanding of lots of things. So this is all hindsight. I didn't know it then. But so we were talking on the phone uh, not too long, like, like a year ago, like in September, I think it was. And he was describing somebody to me, um, not describing. I said, how are so-and-so, so-and-so? And he said, oh, the so-and-so is fine. And the so-and-so's wife, um, wow, she's big as a house. Uh, she's blah, 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 blah. And something, so here's that moment, like this is what I'm, this, these are the actual, what I'm saying in this moment is when he said that, I felt something like, ugh, that's shitty, like that he would say that about this person. And so I didn't recognize it at the moment that, I mean, I didn't say anything at the moment, but I recognized it. So I'm like, oh, that's a weird feeling. So whatever, got off the phone, went and took a shower. As soon as the shower hit me, started crying, said to myself, what's this crying about? And after peeling back the layers, I said, oh my gosh, like the way that he spoke about this person is directly relative to my understanding of the way that like we communicated. And now that communication is awry, a little askew, because I don't relate to him in the same way, right? Like I, perhaps in the past, I would say, oh, I wonder how so-and-so's health is, or I wonder if so-and-so will do something about their their fatness or whatever your their big as a houseness. And so I would be concerned. We obviously used to talk about that was our common bond, right? The sure. people's bodies, not necessarily yeah. the way that they move, but also apparently the way that they look. Mm -hmm. So I got out of the shower. I recognized this. And I, I sent my dad a text as a way that he could look at it, not get offended. I just said, hey, listen, going through some things on my own. And when you said this about this person um it hurt me period like that was it. it hurt me and i'm just gonna ask you if you'll be more mindful about the way you speak about people um because or in front of me because it affects me until i get through what i'm getting through like one day i'll be resilient enough to hear the things from the people who probably instilled it to me the first place and it won't affect me because i'm healed but right now i'm a little tender and I don't need the people closest to me to be nudging me like this right now. I'm sure it'll come to pass and he'll go back. Right. To or he well, you're just, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you're just so raw and to be yeah. triggered like that yeah. is, yeah. Uh, and I don't, I'm, I'm not opposed to triggers. They show you where you're not healed. But during my time of healing, I, the people that I can ask for the support I do. Yeah. So like if my boyfriend talked in that way too, and sometimes, you know, he says things about somebody in the distance, uh, I would have the same conversation with him about minding his P's and Q's until I can get through this. And because he cares about me, he will. So my dad responded, absolutely. Yes. I'm sorry. I love you. Great. Good. He heard me. Good. So fast forward, I saw him in person probably a month later and he gave me this huge hug and he whispered in my ear, you look beautiful. And I was like, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't cause rise for concern, something dad does, should say, whatever. And mm -hmm. so we came home and he says, Jamie, I know you didn't want to talk about this, but uh, I think, you know, whatever you're concerned about your appearance, you look beautiful. And I was like, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Not discounting his effort towards my, however I look, but also I leaned in and I said, I, but I want to know if how I look is direct reflection to who I am. And the person that you had called big as a house, does this, is there any sort of reflection whatsoever about her personality or who she is to you or her place in this earth? Like, why are you so excited to tell me she's as big as a house? What does that do for me? Like, how am I supposed to, are you worried about her health? Perhaps you ask her about her health or you tell me that she's 
I don't know the one with diabetes if but it doesn't have anything to do am I going to say is she as big a house well there's your point like it's never directly related it's just coincidental sometimes that people happen to be fat and have said disease but that doesn't mean that one necessarily causes the other Mm -hmm. Um, it it just means that those two are coincidental like people with yellow teeth might have cancer but I think it's either probably because they smoke just saying you know what I mean like it's not necessarily the yellow teeth that are causing them cancer right Um, not to be so much off topic but the point is is that I so I decided to like lean more into this trigger and say like I'll take ownership of feeling a certain way from hearing certain things but I'm also not going to have a problem standing up to the people who say some stuff and say why is that even important why do you care how big somebody is like why don't you like tell them the things that you do like about them like cool to me, she's, you're telling me that she's big, but what else can you tell me about her? Like the stuff that I'd want to hear, like she's really creative or she's in school or stuff that Mm -hmm. matters in this world instead of she wears a size, whatever jeans. I don't give a shit. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And that makes her less likely of a person. Anyway, so To me, I think the the coolest part about this journey, because it does hurt sometimes and it is painful to look at your shit and some of these parts of the path are pretty rocky, but it's the point of when you can look at them and then see them for what they are, appreciate them, because I'm sure that thought of you disgust me kept me safe um, back then. I will tell you that it took me a probably good week before I could form the words outside of my mouth except for to my boyfriend, like I told him that I said that to myself in the mirror and I cried telling him that. So the fact that I'm able to say it to you and to everybody listening that I had that thought and I can form the words out of my mouth that I've healed a bit. Not saying it's not going to come back in a different form, but knowing that I can get through a sentence without being on my knees and crying about it right now says that I've moved from that place. So there is trajectory. Well, and like you've said, this is a part of who you are. And it's a process, you know, it's a journey, doesn't necessarily, a destination, it doesn't necessarily mean there's ever going to be an end spot, it just may come up much less. Yeah. So, and that's part of the healing process is talking about it. Jamie and I've talked about this many times on the show about taking what's inside and taking it out and specifically with intention. And our intention for today's show was, was to shed light on the dark. Every time we take a light and we shine it all on the dark, it just dissipates more and more and more. So this is part of the healing journey is helping others and bringing awareness to it and getting rid of the stigma and the shame because we all have our own journey, right? And this was uh, Jamie's demon, which I think that a lot of women can relate to on yeah, some it, level. Right. You know? It won't be bodybuilding and men too. for everybody, I but... Right. And I, I shouldn't also say just women, but men, men as well, for sure. Definitely. My, I see so much of myself and this story in mm-hmm. my own boyfriend, like yeah. he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to get on the stage and that's not part of his life. So mine, I just, I took, I took, I got an A plus, I took mine to the extreme, but his rigidity of you know, I, he has a thought and I can see it immediately. Like he tells me, I'm never, I'm not going to eat your food anymore. And I was like, my food isn't your problem. Like, so, and if I'm not in a space where I'm able to have that conversation, it triggers Mm -hmm. me to where I go, maybe I shouldn't eat my food anymore. And then I have to unravel that package before I can step forward into his world and say, okay, well, I'm going to cook. You can eat it if you want. And you get to deal with your own demons because I don't, I'm obviously potentially not the teacher in this moment. He's got his own lesson to learn and his own route to take. But I very much see he's a beautiful mirror for me in that way. Right. And I'll say this before we go into the crystals that you picked for me. Thank you. That um, (laughs) somebody responded to the last post I made about this, like how my eating disorder and dysmorphia started out looking like courage and willpower and health to most people. Control. (laughs) when it's really control, but her response was, you know, you just have courage in a different way now. Right. And I was like, yeah, it's funny is because I, I spend some time, I think you and I were talking at dinner and I thought to myself, if I were to die right now, God forbid, but if I were to die right now, 
I would have kicked myself thinking that I spent so much damn time on this and energy on this subject on this. This is so pointless. This is so much wasted Mm -hmm. quote unquote energy into this subject because it's silly. But then at the same time, I was like, if I didn't have this subject to waste it on, it would be a different subject that would take me deeper into this. And all it's really teaching me is how to be more compassionate, more loving, more kind, more human because even if somebody across from me isn't dealing with weight issues or body dysmorphia Mm -hmm. or eating disorder they're dealing with something I can guarantee it and because we have that in common then I find it an opportunity to say how was I feeling when I was in the depths of my pain and what would I would have wanted from whoever (laughs) that is to say or do to me so I become more compassionate to the people around me because you're asking the important questions and I want to point out that I don't know that it's a waste when something so good is coming out of it because we're we all have our lessons in life and some of us choose to dive into them like Janie clearly has some of us choose to completely numb and avoid them um, whether that be by control or drugs or alcohol or whatever that is right so whenever we take the lesson that we have in the front of us and we dive into it and then we come out on the other side with deeper awarenesses and helping others, then, then that's not a waste, especially when it brings out more compassion and more self-love, which I feel has been one of your greatest lessons that you've learned, not only for yourself, but for other people is the true, true meaning of self-love. Even when loathing thoughts come up, And rather than avoiding those, you curl up in bed and you actually argue with them, talk to them, whatever it is you have to do, but you, you don't avoid them. Yeah, that's true. And I didn't, and that's the courage. Yeah. Right. But that takes a lot of courage. So, so I think it would be really um, cool for, if you're listening to this, just to ask yourself, you know, what, what is it that keeps coming up for you? What is your pointless lesson in life, (laughs) right? Like what, what is it? Because how could you go into that a little bit deeper? Yeah, I have had, uh, uh, and this doesn't have to, I'll reiterate that it doesn't have to look like controlling your food, but people try to control their environment in lots of ways. And most often, if you hear yourself saying, they did this to me, that's something to stop and unpack, period. And that'll take you to, if you can reverse the question, if you can look at how and why you're being affected by what they're saying, then you'll understand your Mm -hmm. portion of this, right? Um, Yeah. It has nothing to do with food. Food is the choice that I made in trying to control whatever I, you know. It's so like- But I bet if- if you well, I'm just me, assuming I would just right. go back and try and eat differently <laughs> instead of like saying, Laura, you, you did whatever, or yeah. the, what you just said, did you mean to offend me when you said that? And you would say, no, of course not. And I'm like, oh, cause I went back and just like, you know, counted all these calories <laughs> as a result right. of what you said to me. And then I would be responsible. <laughs> or yeah, for- I, you didn't mean it that way. Right. Right. But I hope that this inspires you to unpack a little bit more, you know, and to bring in some more self-awareness. And again, what lens are you looking through three things from? I love how you shared that after your dad made the comment, it wasn't even an immediate response. What stood out to me was it was later that you were Mm -hmm. crying. And I love that A, you let the emotions even move up through you. And B, that you set and even um, observed and even asked the right questions, you know, so even slowing down enough to even see our emotion and then even get curious about it. Yeah. Those are the first steps, I think. Thank you. And they don't, that, that part of my process didn't come right away. I am certain. So what'll happen for people who, if they're listening, can stop and say, if they hear themselves say, you do blah, blah, blah to me uh, is one thing and reverse it, right? Ask the questions about yourself there. Um, And also the people who are hurt or offended by something that somebody says and then immediately turn back and take strike at somebody else 
if it feels normal and okay to you to lash out at other people because of the pain that you are feeling, whether it is physical or emotional, is also a direct route to your thing. Because when you see this world as, I know I said this the last time in the um, Lens pod podcast, but everything's okay. And that whatever is riling you up inside is your thing, not the somebody else's thing. Then mm -hmm. when you can start to unpack your thing, then everything turns back to it's okay. You might not like it, but it's not going to create suffering. And I think that my whole plan in this world is to start to eliminate suffering a little bit more. I mean, it's never going to go away because that's the human experience is suffering. But if right. I can start to see it and lessen it more and more day by day, then I'm on the right track. I'm doing Or even it. just move through it quicker, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, just move through it quicker so we can go on to the next lesson, I guess. So one more question before I get into the crystals, then you said that when you start to feel a victim, right? So something happens and you're like, you did this to me. It made me feel this way. You did this to me and it made me feel this way. So then we're encouraging you to stop and ask the right questions. What would the right question look like in that moment? Well, um, why am I feeling this way? Okay. Like why did what she said or he sh said make me feel a certain way? Um, and then that's a, that opens, that can open big doors. Okay. If you're so just start with getting curious. So just, if you're yeah. listening, you just start with starting to get curious about how you're feeling Yeah. about how you're feeling. Okay. If the next answer to that question still turns towards that person, like mm -hmm. because she said, blah, 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 or uh, I keep using she because obviously I'm looking at you, Laura. But like, That's if okay. the person who or the person on TV or whatever mm -hmm. is still causing angst, you got to ask the question again. Maybe find a different words or set it like, or just mm -hmm. you know, like you always say, free write. Like, get to the bottom of this without having your conscious mind try to be so right. protected. I would encourage you to go to the emotion. So if somebody, if you're feeling yeah. some way after a certain conversation. And then let's say your feelings, you, you're hurt. You have some tears. And then you say, why am I feeling this way? Then start with, because I'm hurt. And yes. then I would start with, where am I feeling the hurt in my body? Yes. So I would even go to that portion of, yes. of it. And am, am I feeling in my heart? Mm -hmm. Am I feeling in my stomach? Am I feeling unworthy? Am I feeling unlovable? Um, am I feeling not good enough? But keep going deeper into yourself and keep saying, I'm, 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 and then keep seeing what comes up. Yes. And like you said, some free writing as well. I think when you start to like unlock the... There's going to be a knock in a second. I'm just warning you. That's okay. I thought I actually I before. Um, I... I... I think when you give the permission, when you start turning the arrow back at you, the permission is granted for all of these things to surface eventually, right? Like all of a sudden you get to say, oh, I, it, it, it opens the door to things you haven't looked at. So maybe it's just, I feel hurt. And where do you feel hurt? Sometimes that's a little bit ambiguous to people because they don't want to feel sometimes to begin with. True. Yeah. So if you go, I can't feel it in my heart or in my belly or my throat, mm -hmm. like these are common places, then let it go. It's okay to say, I acknowledge yeah. that I feel hurt. And then yeah. in like a minute or a day or a week, yeah. all of a sudden your heart might actually hurt and you could feel it. And then you go, yeah. huh, look at me. Nothing's even happening around me, but huh, not that my heart hurts and it's radiating down my left arm. Go see a doctor. But <laughs> this is like- it's probably a heart attack. Right, yeah. right. Um, and then it's been heart hurting for too long. Um, but then it's like, oh, more discovery. And then when that door opens, then it's like, oh, more discovery. And then you realize you don't even like need people, need people for this. Like you can start on, you know, packing these things on your own. Yeah. On, on your own accord. It's, of course. Um, yeah. But it's just permission to look at it differently instead of projecting your pain out onto other people, which causes pain. And then you re-eat the pain. And then it's just a cycle of it. It's an right. absolute cycle. So I pulled together for you, Jamie, and for our listeners that um, are going through this. And I went over these with Jamie beforehand. Um, 
So the first one I recommended was Labradorite. Mm -hmm. Just to help you dive deeper and to reflect more, to bring up things that are happening in our subconscious and bring that to light for transmutation, for transformation, and to just start to bring awareness to it. Kind of like it reminded me when Jamie was saying in the very beginning, when she heard different comments from family members and did that plant the seed? Did it not? We don't really know, but at least she's seeing some that was in the subconscious because maybe it didn't put her on this path, but maybe it did, right? We don't know how deep it went into the subconscious, but it, this will help to bring things up, whether the they're I, small or big. The way I think about that is also for the parents that I'm list, that are, might be listening is that mm-hmm. you cannot be perfect parents or you can be perfect parents, but it doesn't mean your children are going to receive everything because there's, there's an in, inevitable lack somewhere. And it doesn't mean you lack as a parent. It just means that, you know, of the hundred percent of the things right. you say, we as children might hear 50% if you're lucky. Right. And so there's obvious holes. And so I, well, we could not... just make one comment. A parent right. could make one comment in right. passing, but a child will take it in 10 different ways. Yes. And we aren't held responsible for that, but it can help us just to see where it is. And again, no blame, like what yes. we were just talking about, going back to where our feelings, because our healing journeys for us 100%. to look at ourselves and to heal, but not to blame. Right. My interest is not blaming anybody. Like I've right. gotten to the point, there was a point in time, I will say this, that I did want to say, how do I tell my parents that they screwed me up? Not in those words. Like, how do I get to blame right. them? And then I was like, this is not going to result in the answer that I want because yeah. I want to be free. And by me wanting to be free of the pain, it doesn't have anything to do with them. It just happened. Right. You'll just keep headbutting parent. and you'll stop right there. Right. The growth, the healing process, the next steps will stop right when the blame starts because you won't go any farther. You yeah. won't ask any more questions. But um, I will never, but I will always acknowledge that that's where. It came like, from. It came from. Started yeah, there, but sure. I'm sure they didn't um, mean it. <laughs> of course not, Jamie. They love you very much. <laughs> Next up, I have a shungite. Mm-hmm. This is a black stone. Um, so I love shungite. You can get in a bracelet form. I love the raw forms better. You can see it even leaves like a mark on my fingers, right? Oh, so yeah. this is nice to take internally because it helps to wash and to cleanse you internally, um, especially if you add the intention to it. So if there's some stuck emotions, especially if you're feeling them in your body, anxiety, pain, whatever that is, it helps to kind of remove them internally as well without even labeling them. Because sometimes we can get bogged down with trying to over figure things out, but this will help to remove them. I also like black tourmaline to keep you grounded, protective. And I think I said something else when we were talking earlier, but I don't remember. Apparently it was just for me. And not for this has just been for you. I'll share later. And then I added <laughs> to, um, we all need more self-love, this huge hunk of rose quartz. But as you're going through the journey of your demons, your shadow side, healing, the dark night of the soul, whatever label you want to give it, you really need to go back to the self-love and to fully accepting yourself wherever you are on the journey. And lastly, I love the selenite because it helps to cleanse as well. Because as you're going through this, you know, just keeping your energy feel cleansed, especially let's say you were wrestling in bed, like Jamie was describing with her demons for an hour going back and forth. Afterwards, it might be nice to just do a nice gentle cleanse with your selenite. Yeah. Lay it on your heart, on your head, med- do a nice meditation with it. Uh, it's a really gentle cleansing stone. The, um, t- I, you and I talked prior to this and I, I didn't really address it, but like there are modalities and tools that I've had help with along the way. Mm-hmm. Therapy is one of them. Um, and I've been, you know, a yoga teacher and practitioner for 20 something years. And I have a chiropractor who is actually very essential in my process. I've done the acupunctures and I've done work with mm-hmm. my doctors and all of the things like they all are supportive, but I'll tell you the most definitive uh, practice that I've taken in it was while I was in the 
learning and teaching of yoga is this philosophy called um, Svadhyaya, which is self-study. And the easiest way to study yourself <laughs> is, for instance, I used to, you know, work out all the time. I was a gym rat. Um, stop. Like people like to call themselves asana junkies or yoga junkies where they're constantly on their mat. Stop one day. Stop for a week. Stop. Just stop. It's, I promise you it won't kill you and it actually might save your life. But what you learn is what you hide within these actions that you're doing that you find part of your um, regimen every day. Like this idea of having to be regimented is a good to some degree, but what happens if something in, the, in life takes any part of your regimen away from you? And when I teach teacher training, and I'm sure you guys have heard this before, is I used to lay on the sofa years ago and look up and realize that my cleaning people hadn't perfectly placed whatever it was on my mantle perfect right like my my candle snuffer was out of place and I couldn't focus on anything until I fixed the snuffer and so like uh, I make my bed every day I wash the dishes after I make food all the time stop doing those things that you find such we'll call it joy because you can mask it in joy the joy isn't doing the dishes the joy is not having that little ocd under your belt to say that you know everything mm. is perfect in your world because life will take the ability for you to do these things away from you right and then you're going to have to deal with two things the not able to do what it is that you like to do and then the thing that stopped you from doing it so whether it was like a car accident so now you're dealing with two things but if you stop on your own accord and you look at the dishes in the sink and you say sweet Jesus, this is bothering me. And then that's the question, right? You don't need Lord. Why is this you. bothering? Why is me? this bothering me? And right. where do I feel it? And why is this? Why, why, why? I ask constantly. Why does it piss me off so much that my boyfriend cannot find the toilet paper to put on the toilet? Or if he finds it, it doesn't make it on the roll. And I was like, I boiled it down. Oh, he disrespects me. <laughs> he doesn't even think about me when it comes to the toilet paper, right? But it's this whole what's the story I'm telling myself? And so I feel yeah. like if you have, if you want to get to your, your thing real quickly, <laughs> stop doing the thing and it'll, it's it'll almost like up. stop doing some of the diversions because when you there, yeah, when they're so routine or routine and you're doing them every single day on some level, there's no thinking mind into it anymore. It's just like when you're driving to work the same route every day, you don't even remember how you got to work. So if they, you drive a different way, you pay more attention to it. So if you do your routines, even in a different order, or even in, you know, just switching things up a little bit, then the diversion will go yes. from that. So, well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I hope this helped a lot of people. I mean, in truth, really good. we could have the same podcast tomorrow and then it would be different. All new things would come up. And so if for those of you hearing this, if I didn't cover something you might wanted to hear how I got mm -hmm. through or what any detail, I'm happy to answer the question. If I don't know, I'll dig in and try and find out for you or take you along on the process with me. But I think this is a really good start. I don't think I've told it in this way um, yet. So thank you for helping me facilitate it. I'm happy to to be along on this journey. My gosh, it's totally my pleasure. Totally my pleasure. So it's okay to us not. We'd love to hear from you guys. You can um, reach out for on this podcast. You can follow me at the will to wow. That's the number two um, on Instagram or YouTube. And Jamie is. I'm at Vegas Yogini on Instagram and peace, love and shattering your barriers is on uh, Facebook. Okay. Until next time. See you then.